So Mary Mead, we are in the midst of the Lion's Gate portal, which is going to peak on August 8. Now the Lion's Gate portal is a powerful time that's thought to amplify the energy of the sun. And essentially it ushers in this potent window of spiritual transformation and spiritual awakening. So each year this portal can help you manifest the desires that you want and help you create the life that you wish to usher in. It can also help you connect to your higher purpose and just seek higher spiritual goals. So in today's episode, we are going to be talking all about the Lionsgate portal, including how you can tap into this energy through ritual, through spell work, and through meditation. So Mary Mead, I'm Aislin. This is Ask Aislin, and I am here today talking about the Lionsgate portal. So saying hi to those who are joining us live. Hello, everybody. So we are going to go ahead and dive right in. But if you are here with us live, the second half of the episode, we'll be doing a Q&A. So if you'd like to drop questions in the chat for that, you can do that. Uh, it doesn't have to be about Lionsgate portal. Cause portal can be about anything related to witchcraft. And I'm just going to dive in. And we are going to start by talking about what is the Lionsgate portal, at least from the astrological perspective. Uh, so the, the Lionsgate portal is an alignment between the sun and Leo and the star Sirius, as well as the Orion's belt and the Earth. So it's a, it's a cosmic alignment that takes place once a year. And um, a little bit about Sirius, we'll talk a little bit about the star Sirius as well as the sign of Leo, which also are gonna add their energies to this. So Sirius is considered a fixed star. Now in reality, um, all things orbit the center of the universe, but uh, from Earth's perspective, the, the star Sirius appears to be stationary. It appears that it does not move, which is why we call it a fixed star. Now fixed stars tend to influence us they're considered to be uh, very forceful powers that can influence our own energy as well as the energies of our astrological chart and kind of the collective chart around us. Um, in some ways, you could think of it as like a focused laser beam. Um, now, this, the brightest fixed star, at least visible from Earth, is Sirius. Um, sometimes it's called a, the, our spiritual sun. So this is kind of interesting because the, the sun, the physical sun here in our own um, solar system, is sort of considered like it lends its energy towards our physical self. So if you think about astrology, your sun sign is you. It is your personality. It's your individuality. But the spiritual sun of Sirius is more connected to our spiritual self and that self that kind of has elevated. It's beyond what's in this world. Now Sirius has long been thought to be associated with abundance and fertility. And from July, depending on the year, July 26th, 27th or 28th till August 12th, this energy, this alignment that we're talking about between the sun, Sirius, the earth and Ryan's belt all takes place. Now on the 8th of August, that is where it hits its exact peak and the energy would be the most potent at that time. So what it means is that at any point when the, this, this alignment is taking place, you're gonna feel that energy, but you're gonna feel it at its greatest potency on the 8th of August. Now, let's talk a bit about, it's, it's not just the modern day culture that talks about this Lion's Gate portal necessarily, or at least maybe this is the words we use today, but even the ancient Egyptians venerated Sirius. They looked at Sirius as the personification of the agri agricultural goddess Sopdet, and they associated the rising of the Nile, which occurred at the same time, or I should say the flooding of the Nile that occurred at the same time with the rising of the star Sirius. Uh, so for them, this was an important time because it was able to um, take a period of time of drought, sometimes of unknown, of uncertainty, and provide sustenance for the land and sustenance for the people. Now, in essence, what this was, was a powerful moment of rebirth every single year at this time. So, so the energy of sort of having this rebirth, having this potent energy doesn't just doesn't just occur in modern witchcraft or well, among modern spiritual practitioners, it goes back centuries, centuries, centuries ago. So, so let's talk a bit about um, Sirius as our spiritual um, sun. 
Sirius is, uh, as I mentioned, is centered around our spiritual growth. And it, it, it's showing me that there are zero viewers. And I just refresh it and I see people in the chat. So hi, Melinda. Hi, Joey. And Jenny's here. Kurt and Cindy. Hi, everybody. Um, so I think we're, we have entered Mercury retrograde. So there's some funky stuff happening here in the feed. But at least I could see you guys now. Uh, so Sirius is concerned with our spiritual growth and like I mentioned earlier, and then the physical sun of our own, um, solar system is associated with our physical growth. Now Sirius can show us the, that there are possibilities beyond this reality. There are possibilities beyond like whatever we think are the confines of our lives. And, um, I think that another really important quality of the Lionsgate portal is the, not just the association with Sirius, but the association with the sun in Leo. So if you think about the qualities of the sign Leo, Leo is um, connected to fire, courage, self-worth, self-belief, magnetism, right? This is, we're gonna talk a bit later about manifestation and drawing things to us. And that is that kind of magnetic energy of Leo. But that energy of Leo, the sun in Leo, is then further amplified by this energy of Sirius during this cosmic alignment. Now, this is a very, very powerful time to bolster these qualities in us. So if you are like a lot of people who feel that your self-esteem or your self-belief isn't always um, at its highest point, and that can be in your mundane life, in your magical life, in both lives, this is a really great time to work on that energy because we have like so much fire energy here between Leo and Sirius and everything. Um, and, and this magnetic energy can, uh, can be infused in us. You can draw that into you to help bolster your own self-belief and self-esteem. So just very, very powerful time for that. Uh, now, numerologically, there also is a lot going on. There's a great significance in um, the portal being at its peak on 8-8. Eight, eight. Now, 8 is associated with the planet Saturn. Saturn, as some of you may know, governs um, structure, discipline, and limitations. Saturn is a taskmaster for us. Saturn also happens to be retrograde right now, which means that it is a time when people may be faced kind of you might feel like you sort of come up against a wall. It may feel that there are limitations. Maybe you can't see what they are, but you can feel them in the energy that you're drawing in. Um, and so that energy can feel like there's no way out, right? There's no way forward. But the reality of it is that it really, what it does for us is it shows us where we're confined or where we're feeling unfairly held back by the universe. Now, if we tip the eight on its side, we get the infinity sign. And there it represents balance, opportunity, optimism, and transformation. So the idea here is that any of the limitations that we might feel that we have are simply opportunities to transform, right? So there's never ever going to be something we're gonna say, we can't get past it in some way. And I think that that is the importance of the number eight in eight, eight and being the peak of the Lionsgate portal. Now, um, this is a powerful time when you can review your limitations. Um, and especially as I mentioned, because there are, uh, we, we do have Saturn in retrograde, we can, we can, uh, but we can review our limitations, we can review our blockages and then tip them on their side and uh, transform them. So I think that to me, that is the greatest gift of the Lionsgate portal. Now, um, the number eight can also be seen as a gateway between the physical and the spiritual. So again, kind of adds into that energy of the Lionsgate portal. Um, we can also think of it as a gateway between the seen and the unseen, right? So it's all about those things outside of you that you desire, those things outside of you that you wish for, the things outside of you that you hope to create and bring into your reality all become possible at this time. So, so that's a little bit of the background of the Lion's Gate. If you want to learn more about it, I would definitely Google it and, um, and you'll, you'll learn a little bit more about kind of the cosmic alignment if you want to know more about that. But what I, what I want to do with the rest of the episode is talk about what we can do with the Lion's Gate portal as witches and as magical practitioners. So I think that this is a time of powerful intention setting 
Now, whether or not the Lionsgate portal is aligned with a new moon or not, it still brings in kind of this energy of new moon. Now, it happens that in this particular year, 2024, the Lionsgate portal is actually very much aligned with the new moon. We had the new moon on Sunday. Uh, so here at the time of this recording, it's Tuesday, we're three days in. By the time we hit the peak of 8-8, um, eight, eight, the peak of the Lionsgate portal will be on the fifth day of the cycle, where we'll still be feeling that new moon energy. So you can take the intentions that you would normally set in a new moon, and you can use this energy to actually further bolster them. It's just simply going to strengthen them. Um, so this energy, very similar to a new moon, means that you can set any intention that you want right now. Um, write down your wishes and your intentions. I would say say them out loud too. Like if you're someone who just kind of writes them and burns them, say them out loud before you burn them. And I think that that could be a, um, you know, a great practice for the Lionsgate portal. It's a great practice for any dark or new moon as well. But just write down what is it that you would like right? And voice that to the universe. Now, um, this is a big energy, like I mentioned before. Um, manifestation is very much amplified at this time. That magnetism of Leo is, be, is in, at play here. This, um, like I mentioned, the Sirius being a fixed star means like it's like a laser pointed focus. So use that energy to draw in the thing that you want to manifest. And don't be afraid to dream, dream big, because if there is going to be a time to set big intentions, now is that time. We are, we couldn't really ask for a better time because not only do we have the Lionsgate portal, but we also have Lunaza season. And um, Lunaza, while it's traditionally celebrated on the 1st of August, it's actually, because of its, uh, because of its cross quarter day status, it moves every year. It's the midpoint between the summer solstice and the fall equinox, and that happens to be today to tomorrow, so the 6th to the 7th. So we just really could not have asked for more. So if there is some big intention you've been wanting, maybe it's even an intention you've been working on and it hasn't been as successful as you'd like, set the intention now, try to do some kind of magical working around it so you can tap into this energy. Um, now, the other good thing, though, too, is that we have this energy because it's a cycle. It cycles through every year. So we have the Lionsgate portal opening again next year and the next year and the next year. So it's not kind of a one and done thing. Of course, we'd have to wait another year for this, this energy, quite an energy quite like this. But nevertheless, the energy cycles through cycle after cycle after cycle. So that would be my first idea is kind of set some intentions and don't don't um, hesitate to dream really big here, okay? Now, um, I think the next thing that I would suggest people do is spell work. So you could add on, you can add more to just an intention. And I think that prosperity, abundance, and money spells are very, very much uh, aligned with this type of energy. Um, so considering that we are in Lunaza season, this is a good time for our prosperity and our abundance magic. So we have a lot of options. Um, in the episode last week where I talked more about Lunaza, we talked about witches' ladders. If you want to learn more about those and some kind of other money um, spells and prosperity spells, I suggest going back and watching that video. I'll drop it in the chat afterwards. Um, you can use candle magic. It would be excellent for this time because of the kind of the fiery energy that we have going on right now. It, candle magic would be very much aligned to this energy. So it can be as simple as taking a candle. If you're going to do prosperity a magic, you might use a green candle. So using a, can a candle that you feel is aligned to, you know, whatever it is you, um, you, you consider the color of prosperity or abundance. You can carve into the candle. You can carve symbols into the candle. You could ca carve in the symbol of Leo. You could carve in infinity signs or, the, or an eight. You could carve in your intention. You could carve in the amount of money that you want to draw in. So we have a lot of possibilities. Um, and then I think coin and money magic are um, very suited for this time of year as well. Um, and if you would want to join us for a very powerful money magic spell, we are going to be doing that at our Lunaza Lionsgate portal ritual on the exact moment of its peak power, 8-8. Eight, eight. So we do invite you to join us um, in that powerful money magic spell, and I will tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, 
So if you want to do some spell work, uh, some correspondences you might want to use are, um, let's talk about some of those. So deities that you could use during spell work or ritual that would be very suited for this time of year would be solar deities, Ra or Helios would be good ones, Amaterasu, the Japanese goddess of the sun, I think would be very aligned to this. Any deities that are connected to abundance, um, money, um, prosperity would also be very much aligned. So kind of the same deities we'd work with at Lunaza fit very well here at the Lionsgate portal. Um, in, we, uh, in our own coven on that ritual on 8-8, we'll be calling in Lakshmi and Ganesha. Ganesha will help us clear blockages and then Lakshmi will help us open to the energy of prosperity. Um, now that is not an exhaustive list, uh, but just a few for, for your consideration. And then colors, you can bring in gold, yellow, orange. Those colors would be very much aligned to the Lionsgate portal, to the energy of Leo and Sirius and kind of the peak of the sun's power. Uh, but also green would also be a great color for abundance and prosperity. Now these colors can be brought in in many different ways, through candles, through altar cloths, um, through the clo co color of the clothing that you wear, the jewelry that you wear. I offer some ideas. Now if you are somebody who likes to bring herbs into ritual or into spell work, you could bring herbs like sunflowers, marigold, those are very good, chamomile, saffron, uh, I think frankincense is a great incense. Personally, I love dragon's blood at this time as well. Um, but frankincense would be a really good one too. I like sandalwood as well. And then symbols, um, if you want to bring some symbols in to place on a, like a lion's gate portal altar, perhaps you want to make, you could bring li uh, images of lions, images of the sun or circles. Um, the astrological symbol for the sun is a circle with a dot in the center. Uh, the symbol eight or an infinity sign um, or sunflowers. Those would be some good symbols as well. And then if you like to work with crystals, any crystals that are yellow are, are immediately going to um, connect to the energy of the sun. Um, and also um, any, any crystals that you might like for prosperity could be used here. So a couple that I think would be really good for Lionsgate Portal would be Tiger's Eye, Citrine, Carnelian, and then I really love Pyrite. Uh, for Lionsgate Portal. Um, and then that leads me into another idea, which I mentioned earlier, but this is about strengthening your, your self-belief. So lean into your inner lion. So really think about, you know, think about the animal, the lion. You could do meditations with the, um, the spirit animal, the lion. Uh, Google it. Google Lionsgate Portal um, meditations. Find a good one on YouTube or uh, meditations to uh, the spirit animal lion and see what comes up. Uh, try that on Insight Timer perhaps as well if, or um, an, a meditation subscription that you have. Uh, but overall, this is just a really great time to kind of bring in the energy of the lion and a great time to strengthen your solar plexus and your self-belief. So breath of fire is an excellent breath to bring in during a ritual or just a practice for the Lion's Gate portal. Uh, for those who don't know the, the breath of fire, um, it is very simple breath and this, the easiest way to do it is just to pretend like you're going to fog up a mirror like that with an outburst of breath and then you close the mouth and then you're just going to breathe in and out through your nose. So there is a pumping of the belly, which is what stimulates the solar plexus, and it is a active staccato exhale and a passive inhale. You don't even think about the inhale, it just comes in, um, in, in between. So that is a great breath to try during this time. Um, I also recommend calling in the energy of self-belief. I think that when we are going to work with really big manifestation, I think that even if we enter that ritual and we say, I totally believe in myself, I think there's always nagging self-doubt that's behind us, it's in the unconscious, it's in the collective around us. So uh, for big manifestation practices, I highly recommend some kind of a self-belief practice. So personally, I like to, um, it's so simple that it seems like it would be almost too simple to work, but you um, start by just tapping on your crown chakra Self-belief is an energy like any other energy, which means we can call it in at any time, just like we call in the quarters, the deities, whatever. And so you tap on your crown chakra and you repeat uh, three times. I'm calling in the energy of self-belief, calling in the energy of self-belief, 
calling in the energy of self-belief. And then you move down to the third eye, the throat, the heart, the solar plexus, the sacral chakra below the navel, and then you can draw all that energy down into your root and have it ground you down there. So I think that practice is uh, very good personally. I do that practice every time before I go on camera. I do it before the rituals that I personally do, and I do it many times. We do it in our um, coven's rituals and um, our shadow seekers rituals. So worth trying, especially if you're somebody who knows you have some self-belief and some kind of self-worth um, issues. But uh, I, I recommend the practice for anybody. And like I mentioned, very, very simple practice that many people will just brush off. They won't even try it. But the people who have tried it have told me, uh, like me, who <laughs> it was a very life-altering and life-changing simple practice. Many people have told me how, what, a, what a game changer it's been for them as well. So try it. Um, and then, you know, other ways to kind of like work with the energy of the solar plexus and our self-belief is just like taking risks and try something new, try a different food, drive a different way home, um, you know, try an activity you've never done before. These are all ways that you work with the solar plexus. And when you work with the solar plexus and you kind of bring in that fire energy, you are more likely to burn away your own self-doubt. Um, and then another idea we can use here is contemplation and meditation. So this is a really good time for uh, meditation, really. And um, so, so what I recommend people do is we've got a couple of different ways we can do this. You can take some prompts and you can journal. In a lot of ways, journaling is meditation. We don't think about that. Like people think that meditation is just sitting and zen, right? And there's just so many different ways that we can meditate. But what I recommend is, you know, try out some prompts with your meditation, especially if you want a direction to go. So here are a few ideas that you could contemplate um, during this peak of the Lion's Gate portal. So how can I align more closely to my true authentic self? Now, you may not have the answer to that, which is why you would be doing it in contemplation. And you just let that question kind of reverberate in your mind and then try to be as open and receptive as you can be and see, see what comes through. Another good question for the Lion's Gate would be, what fears or limitations are holding me back uh, from fully empowering my personal power? So what fears or limitations are holding me back? Here would be another one. What does personal empowerment look like for me? Because it looks different for everybody, right? Uh, what wisdom does Sirius have for me during this open gateway? So that would be another one. It's just what, tell me universe, tell me Sirius, what am I supposed to know right now during this part of the cycle? And then you can journal those prompts if you like. That's a form of meditation. You can contemplate them. Personally, I love contemplating them, uh, well, in a yin yoga pose. So find a uh, good yin yoga pose, perhaps even one for the solar plexus. Um, honestly, a, a really good one is one called caterpillar. It's really easy. And you sit on, um, ideally you have to sit on the floor, though I think you could sit on your bed, but it's probably better on the floor or on carpet or something. And, uh, and you sit up straight with your legs in front of you, and then you just fold over. And so it's like a forward fold, but we call it caterpillar because you stay in it more than just like a breath or two. You're going to stay in it for like minutes at a time and you can contemplate these questions. Let them kind of reverberate in your mind. And the idea here is that your body gets really receptive, more so than if you're just sitting there usually. And, um, and then you may actually open up a little bit more to what's beyond you, uh, maybe even what's down in your unconscious. Things may start to come forth. Uh, maybe get a little bit easier to connect to your guides, hear kind of messages coming through uh, when you're in these really relaxed poses. Um, but other ways to contemplate too, besides just traditional like sitting in meditation, would be walking meditation. So, you know, taking a walk with the express um, intention of, um, of, of contemplating. So this would be a walk that wouldn't be, you know, for for fun or for fitness. It's a, it's a walk that you're engaging in for the express purpose of thinking about these questions. Um, you could do a moving meditation. So this, you could put on some music that is, um, I, would, I would recommend music that doesn't have words so you don't get kind of caught up in the words of the music, but put on some music that is soothing or makes you kind of move a little bit and just start to sway your body see where your body goes, that is a way to kind of open up to more receptive energy and then to begin to contemplate some of these prompts. Um, 
The other thing you can do too, if you're somebody who gets like maybe a little bit lost in meditation or um, you get really distracted and pulled out if you don't have something like tangible to focus on, you can contemplate um, tarot cards. This is a really effective way to sort of open up to receptive energy. So for this one, I would contemplate the strength tarot card. Uh, for those who know the traditional rider weight imagery of that card, it's a lion, a woman and a lion. And, and just um, looking at the card, kind of gazing at it and contemplating it, right? And then closing your eyes and then just sort of seeing if you can recreate the card in your mind. Uh, by the way, this is a powerful practice for visualization as well to strengthen visualization skills and people who, um, who have uh, don't visualize quite as strongly as others. And then you will gaze at the card again and just kind of look at all the details of the card, close your eyes, and then see if you can recreate it in your mind, but eventually letting it sort of carry you away, see where it takes you. Uh, it's like a springboard that will take you to uh, something to contemplate. Um, the other thing you could contemplate too are the other eight cards. Um, by that I mean the, the other cards that have no, the number eight on them in the, in the tarot deck. So the eight of wands, the eight of swords, eight of cups, and the eight of pentacles, and see what comes up when you contemplate those cards. Um, so just a little additional way to do meditation. It can be so many different things, right? Um, and so when people tell me, um, I can't meditate or I don't like to meditate, I usually say you just haven't really found the right way for you. So uh, be open. That's another, you know, we talked about being taking risks and trying new things. It's another way to, to work with this fire energy and strengthen your solar plexus while you're at it. Um, another practice is, um, is practicing gratitude. So we are approaching Maybon. Maybon, uh, you know, comes in six more weeks. It's the, it's the next Sabbath on the wheel. It's very much about gratitude. Uh, many people say Maybon is the witch's Thanksgiving. Uh, but this is also a time, you know, we, uh, we open ourselves up more to prosperous energy when we are grateful for the things that we have. So uh, make a great gratitude list here uh, as maybe part of your Lionsgate portal practice or ritual. Start with eight things that you're grateful for and write them down. And then if you are feeling really ambitious, aim for 88 things and see if you can do it. And don't forget the really small things, right? So if you're having trouble, uh, see if you can just remember um, the air conditioner is working today and so there was a period of time when it wasn't. Uh, and it was broken during the, uh, the height of the summer. So those can be little small things to be grateful for. Grateful that you paid off uh, your paid your car payment this, this month. Grateful that you got work. Grateful that you have friends. Uh, grateful that you rise another day, you know. So uh, just see what kinds of things you can come up with in the spirit of gratitude. And I think that will really open you up to um, the energy of this season as well. And um, so I'm going to end kind of this part of the episode. I wanted to talk about um, prosperity and abundance and kind of mindset here too for a moment. Um, and while we are, while I'm doing this, if you are here with us live, feel free to put some questions in the chat that don't have to be about, um, about, uh, Lion's Gate. They could be about anything about witchcraft, shadow work, energy work, but let's talk a bit about, uh, prosperity and abundance and, um, some of the kind of the blockages I think that people have around this. So, you know, one of the things that I notice is, um, you know, after having had my business here online for two or so years and um, you know I'm working with people for a long time in kind of spiritual settings you know people struggle with the idea of prosperity and abundance that you know they we're open to it but sometimes we're not exactly sure how to draw it in um, sometimes it doesn't look like it reflects what we're draw what we're drawing in like what we're open to sometimes it doesn't look like it reflects that in our in our outside physical lives so so just a little bit of food for thought around um, prosperity, abundance mindset. So in some religions, and uh, the one I can speak to the most is Christianity because it was the one I grew up in. But in some um, religions, prosperity, asking for what um, you want, asking for money, things like that are, is considered greedy. And um, we witches tend to know it's not selfish to ask this. We tend to know it's not selfish to ask for what we need. But a lot of times that is on the surface. 
But if we actually dig deeper down into it, we can sometimes find some limiting beliefs that are either come from our upbringing or come from the collective that tell us that it is greedy or that make us at least second guess ourselves when we're drawing, when we're trying to draw things in. So, um, you know, prosperity, abundance, uh, money, all of these things are energy. Money is energy, just like any type of energy. It can be drawn in, it can be given and it, it can be received and it can be, um, and it can be taken, right? Um, or it can be uh, donated to people or given to people. Uh, so I think that one thing to contemplate are sort of your own ideas about prosperity and abundance, because I think one limiting belief that a lot of us have, because we're such sensitive people and such caring people, is that what, why should I have things when other people have little, have so little, right? And, um, you know, the, the way that the energy of abundance works is it, it, it's not like a tit for tat, like that person's poor when because you're rich or you're poor because they're rich. It, it really, one has nothing to do with the other. And if you really think about it, there are enough resources in the world for everybody. Uh, we just live in a collective where a few people have decided that they get to control things. They get to control resources. Um, and we end up with people who have a lot less. So uh, that is something that ultimately we can't really change um, and probably that won't change in our lifetime. So I hope that it, 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 it abates somewhat. I hope that we can change that somewhat. Uh, but that is the kind of the collective that we're in and the collective that we have to work with. But what we really have to think about though is that my abundance has nothing to do with your abundance or um, somebody else's abundance, right? And me, Drawing in things doesn't mean that other people um, have to lack. And it also doesn't mean that I should feel guilty for having things because someone else doesn't, right? So uh, those are some mindset shifts that we can make um, that you may, uh, off the cuff, you may say, I don't have any of these, but I, I would spend some time contemplating your thoughts about abundance. And if you, if you don't have any of those limiting beliefs, good for you. Uh, you're probably within the minority, at least, um, within our, our kind of communities, um, I think, but at least with the people I've talked to, you know, there's sometimes can be this guilt at, at having things when others don't. Okay. So just the, some ideas for us to explore. Um, you know, another way to think about it too, is that when we have more, we, um, there's a lot of things that can happen, right? We can become philanthropists. When we have more, we can give money and we can give resources to other people. When we don't have anything, it's really hard to give much, right? But when we have more, when we kind of open up that channel of abundance into our own lives, we have more to give. Um, so I'm just kind of offering these for your consideration. You know, the other thing too, is when you have enough, when you're not worrying about, um, you know, where your um, next rent check is going to come from, we um, have more time and energy to put towards our spiritual growth. That doesn't mean that we can't put energy towards our spiritual growth when we are struggling to make ends meet, but it, it, it does make it easier. So, so all of these shifts, like if you, you know, kind of get to, to, you kind of dig down and you realize I do have some limiting beliefs around um, money and prosperity and abundance, uh, really worth, worth looking at. Okay. So that was just one that I sort of mentioned. Others can come from our family. We may have watched our families, um, uh, being very frugal, being very afraid. Um, I know like my, my grandma, um, she grew up during the great depression. And so there was always, and she grew up in like a pretty, um, low income part of the upper peninsula of Michigan. And so there was always this like idea of like, we have to save, uh, we don't have very much. We shouldn't be spending. We shouldn't be extravagant. And um, and there is um, re the reality is that there's good things about that too. But it also can set up some kind of like limiting beliefs in that. Um, so just kind of exploring like what were your parents' ideas around money? What's your family's idea around money? Um, you know, what are your ideas about it? Like um, so, just kind of exploring that at this at this time. So. Um, just thinking about some of these unconscious beliefs we might carry and, um, you know, and really don't be afraid to ask the universe for what you need. Um, so I, I'm going to tell you a bit about this, like, um, 
this story about this money spell that we did, and it happens to be the same money spell that we're going to be doing at the Lunaza Lionsgate Portal Ritual in two days. So I hope some of you will join us for this. It's a very, very powerful money spell, and um, it's a kind of a last minute addition to this ritual. Last year, uh, we did not magic. The year before, Oh, I can't remember. I think it's probably not magic as well. Um, but this year we've decided to do this powerful kind of money magic spell. And it's a spell that I got several years ago from Dr. Joseph Levery. He didn't call it a spell, but uh, it's a spell nevertheless, especially from a witch's perspective. And so when I did this spell and I led a few other people through it, uh, I found very quickly within like one cycle of the moon, I received a sub substantial amount of money that was very unexpected and it did not come through a death or anything like that there was no sad circumstances around it um, it wasn't any anything I didn't have to put in any effort to receive this money and it was just um, a, a big 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 gift from the universe and it came almost initially after this spell other people that I talked to after they performed this spell as well they also found an influx of money. Um, so the energy, why, why I'm talking about this is the energy at this time, especially if we can kind of align our beliefs to this, like really bolstering your solar plexus, your um, self-belief. Like if you have a lot of doubts, um, it, it will get in your way of being able to do prosperity magic and um, abundance magic. But if you can kind of work through those during this time, you're, you're being offered this time as the portal opens to work through that clear blockages, clear limiting beliefs, do some meditation, really align your energies to this, this portal, and then use it to manifest what you want, whether that's money, abundance, prosperity, love, whatever it is, this is the time for manifestation. So, um, so for those who would like to do this money magic spell with us, I invite you to our Lunaza Lionsgate portal ritual on 8-8. If you are already a Shadow Seekers member or you're in our Coven of Midnight's Flame, you guys are already coming. You've got the Zoom link already for it. In, um, you'll find that in your email or the, the portals, uh, the mem membership portals. But for those of you in the public who are not part of either of those groups, we invite you to join us too. We're going to come together. There's a lot of great things that are going to happen in this ritual. We're going to honor Lakshmi and Ganesha. Ganesha helps us clear blockages. So any of those limiting beliefs that people might have, we're going to bust through those uh, with Ganesha's energy. And then we're going to call in Lakshmi, who is uh, the goddess of abundance, fertility, and prosperity, and have her aid us as we uh, do this this but this money magic spell. Now, during the ritual, you will also learn a manifestation practice that some, some of you guys know, um, those who came last year, we taught it then, um, and we're gonna add to it this year. And it's a, a really powerful practice that you can use after the ritual, anytime you really wanna open up um, to the energy of manifestation. So I hope you will join us. Um, for those of you who are in the Facebook, Shadow Seekers, or sorry, Body Mind Witchcraft Facebook group, you will find some advertisements in the group about it. If you're on our mailing list, check your email. You'll, there's some information about that. I'm also going to drop a link here in the chat for anybody who would like to join us. Okay, and you can go to this link. You can read about uh, the ritual and then decide if you would like to join us. So we would love to have you join us. And I was gonna to try to drop this in the chat right now, but I can't access the bottom of the chat. Okay, so it'll have to be after I turn off the camera because it's not, uh, it's not showing me where I can put the link in. Um, okay, so I'm gonna shift now um, into the Q&A. And um, I do have a couple of questions that people sent to me over the week. They're general questions about shadow work and energy work. I forgot to put the, um, the prompt in the group earlier this week that asked people to submit questions. So if you're here with us live, there's some time. We've got plenty of time for questions. Put some questions in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to go through a couple here. And um, this first one is from Ashley, and she's asking about how to begin shadow work. So this is probably like of the top five questions that I get asked. This one is up in the, definitely up in the top five. It may be the top one or two questions. I get asked this one a lot. Um, so shadow work is one of those things that can feel like everybody kind of want, like 
hears about it, they want to do it, you know, you're being told it's a good thing to do, but then people get to this place where like, well, how do I, how would I begin? So the good news is groups like ours, where we focus on things like this, are, have a plethora of information. If you are in the Body, Mind, Witchcraft group, uh, you know, there's a feature in all Facebook groups where you can search uh, for topics in that group. So just type in shadow work and it will pull up all the videos we've done on shadow work. It will uh, pull up different posts about shadow work that will give some ideas. We also have an intro to shadow work workshop, free workshop for the public coming up at the end of August that will also go into all of these ideas of how to do shadow work. But I think that when a person is first beginning and they don't really know anything about shadow work, you know, the shadow is the part of you that has been rejected by your conscious self, but it still is you. So what that means is while we're pushing these parts of ourselves off into the fringes, all of this done unconsciously, we're creating tension. This is an energy that it takes to push all of that part, those parts of us away. And, um, and that's energy that we could be using for other things like spiritual growth. And so when we do shadow work, we um, open up our ability to look at those things that we're pushing off into the shadows, into the fringes of us and contemplate them and um, hopefully recognize that they're actually parts of us that we can then um, integrate back into our own personality which uh, then makes us more whole and complete. It changes the way that we um, interact with other people. So I think that one of the best ways that we can start is by kind of contemplating the parts of us that we either don't like, or, um, and those would be like kind of the more conscious parts of the shadow, or also contemplating the, the things that we get triggered in by, uh, about by other people. So if there's like a kind of person that triggers you or a thing that people do that triggers you, it's really worth exploring it. Now there's this, this idea that like whatever we see in other people, it's an aspect of ourselves that we're ignoring. And so it, let's say you get really um, triggered by people who are greedy, who like take more than everybody else. So it's worth exploring like in what areas of my life am I greedy, um, but also kind of exploring our um, beliefs around like what does it mean to take, uh, things like that. But you know, what you also may find when you start to look at that, like in this example, the, the greedy person that you're getting triggered by, you may find that it goes back, we trace it back, it may go back to an incidence in um, childhood. Uh, something that happened in your family and it so it's triggering more it's more it's not really about that person out there in the the present they're just showing you something in yourself that's unhealed but you use it to allow you to kind of dig deeper and ask the deeper questions about how we could heal that and then hopefully we would then also acknowledge well there's a greedy part of me too um and and then and then be able to integrate that into ourselves you know another big one is anger like we sometimes want to push our anger away or just eliminate our anger but you know our anger serves a purpose so so there's a lot we can do in our shadow work to try to like take um, maybe perhaps the, the less, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess the less positive aspects of our personality, ways that we can, um, I, I guess, like sub, subvert them into something that's more positive. So like our anger can be turned into art or into activism, right? Rather than just pushing it all down inside of us or praying that it goes away. So, um, so those, these are the ways to really kind of start with your shadow work is just looking at the ways around you, the places around you where you feel uncomfortable and you're getting triggered and then contemplate it. But you will get a lot more ideas um, by kind of searching in this group and also by, if you're on our YouTube channel, anybody who's watching in YouTube, we have a lot of shadow work videos on there too, in addition to the free workshop coming up at the end of the month. Um, okay, so that is, I hope that helps Ashley. And then Brian wants to know which chakra to begin working on. Um, so, so when I get a question like this, you know, um, what I would first ask a person is just sort of like two different um, 
pathways to work on chakras and I think that they both, to, personally for me, I use both of the pathways and I recommend that people try both of them as well. So one is where we just do an all out balancing of the chakras. Like let's face it, the world that we've chosen to incarnate in is pretty uh, messed up, right? And so a lot of ways to get unbalanced imba by um, traumas that have occurred. Uh, limiting beliefs, um, injuries, you know, uh, negative experiences, all of these things really create some blockages in our energetic pathways. And so I recommend anybody who's like, especially if you're first coming to this, you've never done any chakra work, I would just start at the root and I would go right up from there and maybe spend um, a couple of weeks working on the root chakra and then move up to the sacral chakra and then go to the solar plexus and just systematically work through the chakra system for the first time. Um, it, but at the same time, you can also focus in on one or two chakras that are particularly bothersome for you. And this is where you can use your body as a barometer. So if you're having like a lot of neck tension and headaches, that would tell me that this person needs throat and third eye, um, and, and perhaps even heart because the heart chakra, uh, can go up into the shoulders and sometimes that can cause headaches and, um, neck stiffness. Now what's happening is there's blockages, you know, there's stuff happening in the physical body, but underneath it, this is indicating that there are blockages in this part of the energetic body. Now, if a person was having stomach issues, I would direct them towards the solar plexus. If they're having tight hips, I would direct them towards the sacral chakra. So you can take any, any physical ailments or symptoms that you have right now and use that to guide you on which chakra to start with. And you can be doing both pathways at the same time. Um, and in my own personal practice, that's what I do. I'm kind of just like always working to balance. And then I'm focusing in on the chakras that I think need the most work at that time. So uh, hopefully that will help. And again, um, like the shadow work question earlier, you can also go into uh, any group on Facebook and search for topics. So if, if you go into our Body Mind Witchcraft group, you can search for chakras solar plexus and see what comes up and then you're going to get a bunch of information on that topic. Um, okay, so those are uh, the two questions. Hope that one helps Brian, uh, but if you want to um, ask any more specific questions about it, let me know. And I'm going to check the chat here. So um, I see that Cindy was saying that she's still trying to learn how to read tarot cards. Um, you know, honestly, it's like anything in witchcraft. It can take time. Um, I wouldn't expect to know how to fully read them um, uh, um, right away. So I think that there is this really good book and it's called Tarot for the Self. Um, I can't remember the name of the author. I've recommended it to several people who've told me afterwards that they really liked the book a lot. I think it's a really good book because it goes through the cards and it asks you some questions and it, it makes you contemplate kind of the topics in the card for yourself, which I think really can help people in their, um, uh, in their studies to learn how to do the tarot. But, um, that would be my recommendation, you know, just keep at it. It take, it does take time and, you know, you want to be consistent with it, but kind of exploring the cards one by one can really help a lot. Um, and then, uh, Joey was saying, can't wait. I think he means for the, um, probably for the Lunaza Lionsgate ritual. Um, so any other questions here, put them in the chat. I don't know if there aren't any, or I just can't see them. Um, because, it's just, uh, feed's not really showing me much. So if I miss anybody's questions, I will go back later and okay. Now all of a sudden here, I see some questions. Okay. Um, okay. So Melinda said, what string do you use for a pendulum? What is the best way to start practicing divination with a pendulum? Okay. Good question. So, um, I guess if you're asking about the string, are you, um, planning to make the pendulum yourself? Uh, what I would recommend for somebody starting out is probably to purchase a pendulum. Um, they don't, uh, they don't have to cost a lot of money. Uh, I just got one recently, you know, sometimes they're five or $10. A lot of times they'll come, um, at least the ones that I have come on like a silver chain and then the crystal is attached to the bottom. If you were going to make one yourself, I don't know that there's necessarily um, a right or wrong kind of material to use, uh, though I think that those silver chains 
tend to, tend, in my experience, tend to be the best, which is why I would recommend just like purchasing one. And then what I would do is I would purchase a stone, purchase one with a stone that you're kind of drawn to. So the one I got recently was rose quartz. And I wasn't particularly, um, like I love rose quartz, but it wasn't my first thought for a pendulum. But when I went into the store and I was feeling them all and kind of feeling their energy, this was the one I kept getting drawn to was the rose quartz. So that is um, how I ended up picking that, that one. Um, after that, what I would do is um, I brought it home and I've been sleeping with it under my pillow for a while before I even began to use it. And that helps to kind of infuse my energy with the energy of the pendulum and get us sort of like resonant together. And then from there, I, which, you, you know, the very, very first thing you want to do is to program the pendulum so that you understand what it, um, how it's going to speak to you. So what what usually you'll do is, you know, you hold it with a relaxed hand and you want to ask it to show you yes. That's sometimes the first question I'll say is like, show me yes. And then it will make some kind of a movement and then um, say, show me no. And then it will generally make a different type of movement. And so you do that. And then what you want to do is you want to sort of like to validate your own, maybe like self-belief and the fact that you're actually going to be able to use the pendulum is you start asking questions that you know the answer to. So you would say like, is my first name Melinda? And hopefully it will go to the, the, the yes um, movement and then ask it a question that's false. And hopefully it will go to the no movement. And once you kind of confirm the, that you've got the yes and the no straight, that's when you start to ask it other questions. And I, I, for somebody who's first starting out, I, I would stick to the yes and no questions, but eventually you can get pendulum boards that have letters um, around them or runes or different symbols. And you can really go, um, you can get pretty um, elaborate messages from the pendulum that way. But I found using it like for yes and no um, can, all, can be very helpful. So when you're starting out, that's what I would do. So hopefully that helps. So ask more, um, elaborate on it if there's like more specifics you want to know. Um, okay. Uh, Kurt said he's been thinking about science and witchcraft. You know, Augustus Ferdinand Mobius with his Mobius strip theory. It is very interesting to see what certain people in science found that could apply to witchcraft. Um, the name sounds very familiar, um, but I can't place where what I know about it. So I can't, unfortunately, I can't speak to that, <laughs> to that at all. But I will, um, I'm going to look it up afterwards, and I'll share my thoughts on it too. Um, sounds really, I know that sounds very familiar, but I just can't place like what I know about it right now. So sorry about that. Um, any other questions, but I will just to not, it doesn't help answer your question. But I very much, um, as, as some of you know, I am a math and a science teacher in my muggle life, and I, I very much think that science and witchcraft align uh, uh, very, very much. Uh, there's a really great book that's called Real Energy by Isaac Bonowitz. Uh, if you can find it, it's out of print. It was, um, oh God, probably written in like the 70s maybe. A really good book. And what I really love about that book is that he had this friend who is oh, as a physicist. I think there are actually a couple couple science guys, and he and these guys were in um, pr also practiced magic, and so there's a whole section where they write about their perspective as scientists and how they feel that it um, science and magic are are very much in alignment with one another. So it's a really fascinating book. Again, it's called Real Energy by Isaac Bonowitz, if you can find it, um, out of print, but a very good book if you can get your hands on it. But I, I agree with you, Kurt. Uh, it's science and witchcraft. There's so much intersection between them. I have always believed that, um, you know, the things that we say are impossible or that the outside collective says are impossible, you know, magic doesn't work, it's not real. It's science just simply hasn't caught up enough to be able to measure some of these things. I think the, the real key is the, the big um, breakthroughs we are having in quantum physics that day by day are changing our view of the universe. But I think that's going to offer us um, a lot of answers. And, um, and one day, all the things that we know are true um, uh, will be readily accepted. I, I don't know if it'll be in our lifetime in this um, incarnation, but I, I do believe that, um, that someday 
there will be much more of an, um, an alignment between science and magic. Um, okay, so um, any more questions, drop them in the chat. Uh, I do want to mention that our Demystifying Witchcraft course is coming um, uh, very soon. Uh, up until this point, the only people who have access to it for the most part are those in our Shadow Seekers membership, but we're bringing that to the public very soon. It's a course on um, the foundations and fundamentals of witchcraft. It takes you through everything from, you know, the history of witchcraft all the way to like building your own spells and rituals, um, how to cast a circle, how to work with elements, how to call deities. So if you are looking for kind of the foundations of witchcraft, if you um, have no formal training, this is a great course for you. Um, even if you've been on the path for a while, you may find like this one stop shop place where you can get all your information to be very helpful. And if you're new to the path, this is especially good for you because it'll take you from um, the beginning and help you feel confident in your abilities as a witch. So watch for that. That is going to be coming out later this month. Um, and then we also have our Shadow Seekers membership opening at the end of the month for anybody who wants to really up level their spiritual practice through shadow work and energy work and witchcraft. Um, you may really find that you want to join our membership. Okay, so I am going to sign off for tonight. I hope to see some of you at our Lunaza Lionsgate portal um, ritual on the 8th. It looks like I can actually drop. There we go. Now I can see the bottom of that. Oh, I've got a couple more questions here too. Um, I think I dropped that <laughs> link in there. No, I don't see it, but um, let's see. Um... Oh, Joey said, uh, Demystifying Witchcraft is a great course. Awesome. Um, okay, uh, Joshua said, I've been looking into Crowley, Lon, um, Milo, De I think it's Dequet, Dequet, Agrippa, and Diane Fortune, good authors. Is there other practitioners you would recommend? Um, I think it depends on the, the type of witchcraft that you want to study, uh, witchcraft and magic that you want to study. Those are great authors. You've already got a good start there. Um, personally, I like Christopher Penzak a lot. He's one of my favorites, and I will recommend him to everybody. He has a series of books, um, the first two called The Inner and the Outer Temple of Witchcraft. Um, very good for people who want to kind of learn the fu fundamentals of witchcraft. Um, other authors, I mentioned Isaac Bonowitz earlier. I really, really love him a lot. And um, uh, Raven Gramasi is a very good one for anybody who's studying Wicca. Um, that would be a good author to try as well. But, but you have some really good ones on your list already. Um, but those would be a few recommendations um, that I would say. Adane McCoy, I like her as well. There's a whole series of books by um, Lu by Llewellyn that are all about the Sabbath. So it all kind of depends on like the, the type of magic that you want to practice or the thing you want to learn more about. And then I could offer some more specific names. Okay, so I'm going to um, sign off now. And um, I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode. If you liked what you hear, leave a heart or a thumbs up. It will help us get this out into the feed of more people. And if you're watching back on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the channel, Body, Mind, Witchcraft, and you won't miss any future episodes. All right, until next time, blessed be.